Hello everyone and welcome indeed to this session. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the organisers for inviting me to present here this morning and I look forward to sharing with you in the question and answer session afterwards. I hope you don't mind but I've just adapted the title um, ever so slightly uh, from what I was uh, first given because I realised that there are nurses who undertake your DFSRH and you've got nurses um, as part of your faculty trainers as well. So I thought it more important to talk about interprofessional health education, especially as there are some crucial differences which I'll highlight throughout this presentation. Uh, feel free to tweet me at any point. My Twitter hashtag is there, uh, my Twitter address is down the bottom. So feel free to use that and I'll get back to you whenever I can. So my name is David Evans and I'm Professor in Sexualities and Genders, Health and Wellbeing at the University of Greenwich. I'm really fortunate to have been around the block a few times in regards to sexual health education because I've just passed my 32nd anniversary since I first started teaching. In those days I started off uh, running particular HIV courses and then the HIV uh, education broadened out into wider sexual health, sexual reproductive health and other dimensions of sexual well-being. So I've been doing that now for these past 32 years. Um, you might notice there's a spelling mistake on this uh, slide, but it's quite intentional because the very first time I ever did a presentation uh, to, 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 to medical professionals was at the subgroup of the Royal College of Physicians, maybe about 20 years ago. And I was so nervous about it, I asked one of my friends to go through the presentation and just check it for accuracy for me. And all of a sudden she got to one slide and she said, David, you've got a typo on here. Um, you've got double L in sequelae. And I kept a really straight face and I looked at it and I said, oh no, in Wales, where I come from, we pronounce that sequelae. So if Dr. Jane Dixon's present today, Jane, that one's for you, okay? Now, a few years ago, I was really lucky to be able to present at the all-party parliamentary group for sexual and reproductive health. And there were a few of us presenting that evening, and we'd all been asked to focus on this particular document on medical education by Professor Sir David Greenaway. And we had to work through um, Professor Greenaway's work and then consider how that related to our own fields of practice, whether in clinical, uh, clinical work or in education. And just five days before um, the all party uh, presentation, Lord Willis produced his report on training and education for registered nurses and healthcare assistants. And I read the two documents and couldn't get over how different they were. A real case of chalk and cheese. And that obviously has some impact on your DFSRH and on your faculty trainers at the moment. From the medical point of view, it was spectacular really encouraging medical professionals to do as much education and training as possible. And even once they get to consultant, if they wanted a, a sideways move, for example, in their career trajectory, they could undertake the education, or if they wanted to do research doctorates, they could do all of that type of stuff. And the Greenway report was saying, and the money should be there for this to happen. But in the world we live today, and especially across the different healthcare professions, there are lots of disparities especially in access to um, study time, to money for uh, courses, and that will have a knock-on for your own organisation as well. So really important two crucial documents that underpin so much of what I'll be saying today. Then back in 2014, and again last year in 2021, I was asked to present um, to the uh, the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine, one of your sister organizations within the RCOG. And the first time in 2014, it was to consider the fact whether nurses and physiotherapists could actually under, undertake the diploma course of the Institute of Psychosexual Medicine, whether they could undertake the course, but crucially, whether they could sit the examinations and then receive the same sort of qualification. And by the time we got to 2021, and I was asked to do another presentation, this time looking at how to put their professional education qualifications within wider academia, 
But by the time that the, this presentation was done, the IPM informed me that not only were nurses and midwives undertaking the courses and getting the credentials, but the IPM had voted to allow nurses and physiotherapists to become full members of the organisation as well. So great developments going on, especially within our different domains of sexual, uh, um, sexual health and sexual well-being. Now, there were certain areas I was asked to address um, for the presentation. So I've put these as some of the main circles that you can see on the screen here. Uh, first of all is this phrase when people keep talking about going back to normal. Of course, it's really important for us to be able to talk about sex and talk about sexual health. That hasn't changed from that point of view. The need is still there to do it. But when people keep talking about um, in some sort of post-COVID era, whether we can go back to normal... Whatever they're talking about as some golden era of normality didn't really exist. And was that best and best suited to your ongoing practice now today? So I'd encourage you not to think of going back to normal, but use the opportunity of this session to consider ways in which you can start creating your own new normal, which is going to be forever fluid and ever changing as we go forward. So, yes, yeah, really important to keep on talking about sexual health, but the ways in which you're going to be providing teaching, learning and assessment could be quite different. So, first of all, let's look at some of the impact of the pandemic. And um, although there are so many tragic stories around the pandemic, so many instances of really terrible situations for and for so many of you the way it's impacted on your lives maybe personally as well as professionally but out of that looking at some of the positives that we can take from that to move forward I'd certainly say that in relation to teaching learning and assessment there are some great benefits we can now build on as we move through this era of the pandemic. For a practical point of view, of course, there was a huge impact on your services. Some of you might have been redeployed to work in other fields of practice. Um, maybe your services closed down to physical contact and you weren't able to do the usual routine stuff that you were doing. And also there was an impact on the education provision as well, because without the face to face teaching, which you'd been used to in the past, that had to change. And also then there were implications for assessments, especially when there have to be assessments on real people. Uh, uh, uh. Um, uh, in life situations. So there were lots of challenges, but I'd encourage you to start looking at the positive ways to move through these. But there were also some other things that need uh, um, attention as well. On the one hand, we're now starting to hear and, and see some evidence that, that less sex was happening, especially during the, uh, the early lockdowns. That might have been less sex happening in certain households or in between households. Certainly people weren't going out and they couldn't, par oh, they couldn't party and go out and have sex in the way that they had been. But also there was a knock-on effect for that with contraception contraceptive vulnerability. Say, for example, if somebody had been used to taking the contraceptive pill and then thought, well, I'm not going to be having sex for a few months, so I might as well stop taking the pill. And then when they restarted having sex, if they hadn't uh, um, um, gone back to their method of contraception, they could have been vulnerable then to unplanned uh, conceptions. And and we also know from a report that came out from the Office of National Statistics only last week that even the under 18 year old teenage pregnancy rate dropped during the early lockdowns of the COVID era. Also, with fewer sexual encounters, there were fewer um, young people accessing various types of sexual health services. And some anecdotal evidence coming out from particularly GU services at the moment is that although there was a cut down on numbers of young people accessing the service, a greater percentage of those accessing it um, did actually have safeguarding issues of various types, one or the other. Um, also, growing awareness that trans, intersex and non-binary people are often missed out across all sorts of health services. Even if a GP practice, for example, has a computer system that recognises only the binary opposites of male and female, then someone who's 
transitioning or someone whose genitals may not ma um, match their gender presentation, um, a lot of people are being missed out. So that's something we need to pay more attention to. Also, the number of people in uh, uh, um, accessing uh, fertility services and now being seen as being more atypical as well. But the, the postcode lottery is having a negative effect on uh, some people's request for fertility assistance. So say, for example, in some parts of the country, if you've got uh, two lesbian women as partners. In some parts of the country, both of them could access IVF. In other parts of the country, there's a restriction that only one can. So a postcode lottery um, still having negative effects on some people. And also there's greater awareness that we need more and more HIV testing done as a normalized part of healthcare. And so many, well, all of the antenatal clinics are doing it. So many A&E departments, um, lots of areas in general practice, especially with new patients. So there are lots of opportunities where HIV is becoming more normalized. It may be a bit hit and miss across abortion services and um, across some contraception services as, as well. So a greater imperative to look at normalizing that. But then looking at some of the electronic ways of sharing learning, teaching and assessment as well. There have been some great opportunities. And as Green et al say here, for effective, con um, effective communication is central to uh, health education. And one of the big problems that so many students tell us about is that they find the shift onto virtual learning platforms has been a bit sort of artificial for them. Whereas sitting in lecture halls or classrooms, they can just talk to the person next to them. Here, they're now being um, talked at and maybe not having such a great opportunity in being able to present. So it's important to look at ways of hearing everyone's voice. And I'll come on to this um, uh, um, a little later. So really, really important there to let everyone's voice happen. But whether you're using Zoom or Microsoft Teams, even putting people into breakout rooms doesn't always seem to, to help. So really important in making every contact happen, and I'll show you how in just a moment. But there's so many opportunities in which you can make those uh, moments happen. So whereas in the past there was so much attention on face-to-face uh, uh, -face teaching, classroom uh, networks and clinical practice. Now look at the ways in which you can use various types of blended learning, synchronous and asynchronous, and build into that communication requirements. So even if it's asynchronous learning, rather than people just uh, being passive learners, learning from whatever is on the screen in front of them, look at ways in which you may be using chat rooms um, or other forms of communication where they can share their learning with each other so that there's not this huge divide between we can all talk to each other in a classroom, but we're quite silent and not, not heard when we're not in a classroom. So we've got to look, look at all the wonderful ways in which we combine the innovation of teaching today and look at ways in which to give our students a voice. And one of those ways is around the flipped classroom, but there are some inherent problems with that as well. With the flipped classroom technique, it's preloading the learning. So rather than the learners wait until they go to a classroom to be a, a part of a lecture uh, series or to be able to engage in simulated practice, rather than those opportunities, you do a lot of the main learning beforehand and there are going to be skills required in that. So say, for example, if you're de designing web pages and you're putting lots of the learning into there. In a classroom situation, you might have done a presentation for maybe an hour or two hours. That doesn't work with good e-learning. So it's looking at ways of maybe turning your flipped classroom resources into more like CPD articles, where there may be elements of information giving, which you might be doing as video, or if you're doing demonstrations, do those as video, but also give opportunities where you can ask ask questions of the learners and then give them some sort of feedback on whether they're on the right track or not. But where there's another big problem with this is if learners have been so accustomed to just turning up to conferences or classroom sessions, um, especially those where they're more passive learners, so they go along to be, to be talked at, they attend a conference and they're listening all day long. 
Now, to try to get them to access the material earlier, say a week before the session, so that when they come to the session, it's more of a workshop built on their prior learning. That, that sometimes requires a lot of encouragement of learners just to make that shift. And to make it even harder for them, look how many people will not get time maybe time off work or space in their day in which they can do lots of um, e-learning. That's another one of the problems that we have to consider then. Okay, so, but also the workload realism for yourselves. You may have some sessions prepared and you think, right, I can go into a classroom, I can deliver these sessions and I know exactly what I'm doing here. But to turn that into effective uh, um, e-learning, it's going to require skills. It may be new digital learning for yourselves on different types of software that you're going to be using or even uh, uh, videoing. So lots of new things. And there is an increased burden on your workload. So very important to consider, especially given the clinical implications of your work uh, during this COVID time. And I said a couple of minutes ago that I'd mentioned ways of getting people to talk to each other better. So with MS Teams and Zoom, if so many of your learners find the breakout rooms rather artificial there, then I'd really recommend this to you. And I've put a little training video on the resource I'm providing as part of today's session. It's on a website which is free and it's called wonder.me. And you create particular spaces. I've got two of them showing here. But when people are accessing this, first of all, it asks to take a little photo of them. And maybe you can set uh, um, an icebreaker question. So they answer the question. And then when they enter into the room, their little photo appears as a small avatar that they can move around. And as they bump into others, as they get close, so it turns on their video cameras. You can have up to 500 people on here at a time, but it's certainly wonderful for saying to people, right, move around the room, chat to people you haven't met before, or maybe even have certain named zones and get people to go to the different zones and move around. And then when you want to do your main teaching, there's a little button on there where you do the main broadcast, and that's when you can do your presentations there. So it's free at the moment, and it's a wonderful way, especially of getting people to talk to each other, whereas they might find it artificial in other resources. Now, when it comes to the impact on study, yes, there's been a lot of impact for you, whether that's across the physical space to be able to do it, how to assess clinical uh, uh, um, assessments. And certainly from our point of view at Teaching Sexual Health at Greenwich, we really want to make an impact here. So it means that the, the ways in which we used to do things aren't working like that anymore. So we need to reimagine it. And it's so important that you carry on doing this, especially for inspiring the next generation uh, to come into sexual and reproductive health. So look at ways in which you're making their learning really relevant to them personally and inspiring and challenging for them. Um, because as part of the challenge, we, uh, we may be really good at doing presentations, you may be doing lots of videos, you may be doing stuff on Zoom or Microsoft Teams, but one of the areas that, that is often a challenge for so many educators is around assessments. And especially because within your own programs, um, you need clinical assessments done, then what are the new ways in which you can think of adapting maybe some of these? There are certain ones that you will say have got to be seen, they've got to be witnessed physically. Uh, person to person. But what are all the other forms of assessment that may not need to be done that way? And can you think of more creative ways in which to do those assessments? So really important for us, especially as uh, um, your, your learners are moving in a world that is becoming far more digitally aware. OK, so that's some of the impact of the pandemic over the space and time. Uh, with latest approaches in education, it's really important to consider the ways in which, especially younger people coming through into universities today, are far more digitally aware than even students were five or ten years ago. So that's a constant 
development. And we need to keep ahead of the game there. So looking at all the different types of programs and apps that you can then embed within your learning to give people a more rounded experience in um, digital learning as well as traditional type. I've mentioned the flipped classroom technique, but also the active learning, where so many students would have been accustomed to passive type of learning, especially around uh, um, listening at conferences, for example, a passive form of learning. And therefore, it's important to start looking at ways of encouraging more active participation. But it's also important for us to consider the, uh, um, the, the theories around uh, uh, e-learning in relation to pedagogical practice, so teaching practice, but also andragogical practice as well. So adults learning differently to children, for example, and the way in which we talk differently then about pedagogies and andragogies. But it's no good just looking at that in relation to how you perform in the classroom, but considering ways in which this is relevant through e-learning as well. And that goes back into that active learning, sharing learning with others and getting them to be able to share it as well. Let me say a few words on assessment again. And here are two really famous names, um, Kay Samble and uh, Sally Brown on assessment. And I've put links for Sally Brown and Phil Race on the resource with this, where they've got great videos and resources on how to start rethinking the whole notions of assessments. And especially going forward, looking at compassionate assessments as well. Certainly from an educational point of view, what we found during the early days of the panic was that so many of our um, qualified healthcare professionals were really struggling. They were struggling with the clinical reality of the world that they were living in. And on top of that, they might have seen their studies as a burden. So as universities, we all tried to do our best uh, to change as much as we could to take that burden off them. So it's looking at being compassionate in the ways in which we assess their learning. With this quote, I'd just like to emphasize the need that we're going to have to consider our new normals. So as we're moving forward, what are the ways in which we're going to redesign our teaching, learning and assessing to be uh, far more relevant, not just in a post pandemic era, but also to the changing dynamics of learning uh, today. It's also important to consider um, what Griffith and Burns called cash, knowledge, attitudes, skills and habits, because especially for some of the, uh, um, the world realities we're seeing at the moment, with the dreadful war um, in Ukraine, with displaced people from so many parts of the world, you know from sexual health services that when patients come in to you, they may be coming in with whole loads of um, individual challenges themselves that quite often a lot of our education doesn't necessarily prepare them for. So there is an important element that we consider the wider dimensions of um, the curriculum that we provide. So it's not just a case of learning particular skills on how to do them, but we also need to challenge attitudes, um, um, inform knowledge, and be able to uh, practice this on a more regular basis. So get in the habits. So the knowledge, attitudes, the skills and the habits. Now boil that down into clinical practice and say, for example, if a woman uh, who has been raped or tortured, maybe as part of war crimes going on elsewhere, now comes along for genital examination. Of course, there are going to be different ways in which you have to, uh, to, to work with this individual and uh, diff different ways in the whole approach. So that must be part of the education you're giving as well. Don't just look at it from the point of view of the particular skills needed for certain types of examinations, but look at the person behind those skills and explore the attitudes as well. And another little quote I'd like to share with you here then is on students, teachers and our learning uh, um, institutions having this unprecedented opportunity to actively participate in co-creation. And it may mean that you have to go back to your learners today and ask them what are their particular learning requirements. So 
don't just stick to a formal curriculum because it's always been done that way or your regulatory bodies require it to be done that way. We've got an opportunity now to start assessing these things, to look at it from through the students' eyes as well as the institution's eyes as well. And that's going to be really important in getting your learners on board to be partners of the education that you provide today, enabling them to be uh, greater citizens of tomorrow. And as part of the current trends uh, um, within education and training, look right across sexual health over these last 20 years or so, look how many documents we've all received on developing uh, the relevant type of sexual health learning for our particular uh, areas, the different domains of sexual health, but also, especially within professional groups and nurses uh, um, as one particular group, where even job promotion, career progression, is dependent on various academic qualifications. And that poses another bit of a problem, because when so many nurses do professional courses, which may not then be recognised by universities, and yet to get the university qualifications, they still have to um, pay fees and go off and do those, then it can mean that they're paying for two sets of learning. So obviously there are great ways in which collaboration can happen so that the end point for the individual learner isn't going to be cost um, uh, so much on them, nor on the fact that they're going to have to repeat their learning, because that's Another big problem, if people are doing professional courses and then go to universities and have to repeat similar type of learning that they've already done. So we as professional organisations and higher education institutions, we need to talk to each other much better as well. There's a really important quote I like sharing here from Griffith and Burns in a book called Teaching Backwards of 2014, when they say that if learners can't learn the way you teach, you need to learn to teach the way they learn. And in this changing world now of technology, that's one of the things that we all have to be learning together. Because in clinical practice, you're all used to using technology in so many different ways, whether it's from patient record to different types of examination techniques. But where there's a bit of a mismatch then is with more of the creative learning apps available through so many different sources that aren't being utilised as part of education. So the more we join those up together, the more we're getting newer generations of people who are so fluid in the way in which they, they, they access electronic forms of learning as well as their clinical practice. And that was something emphasized by Mac McDonald et al. when they did uh, um, a review of preferred teaching uh, styles. And so many of the respondents were saying they prefer bits of both. So love the classroom stuff, love the conferences, but also love some of the um, uh, e-learning as well. So the challenge for all of us is looking at how these can work much better together for the enhancement of learning. But we've got to realise that some people still are quite technophobic whether that's our healthcare professionals or maybe even some of the clients. So it's difficult then if health education is moving on at such a great pace and leaving some people behind. And uh, uh, recent reports have been showing how uh, particular individuals need to embrace uh, e-learning much more. And with the RCN here talking about all nurses should become um, e-nurses, but also we have to recognise that there's a lot of digital poverty going on. And whether that's in particular devices, because we have some students, for example, who at the beginning of the pandemic might say, well, the only way I can access um, class is on my phone. Or some people may be living in areas where they haven't got good internet access. Um, and even those then who may have caring responsibilities at home, maybe children, pets, um, uh, sick people. So they've got caring responsibilities going on or they might just be shy or embarrassed about showing where they live. So we've got to be able to realise that. Spin that around on its head and look at a positive, though. Look how many people would have been feeling a bit poor and left out in relation to affording going to different conferences or paying for study events. So there are some swings and roundabouts in relation to that as well. And the final area here is talking about teaching, learning and assessment, but also in relation to clinical practice. Um, 
So look at all the assessments that you require of people. Some are those in person, some are really physical, but look at all the others and ask yourselves, are the assessment styles the most appropriate to look at the learning outcomes for your individual learners? And that's where you can go back to your students and say, right, if we're going to redesign our curriculum, if we're going to look at our assessments again, how would you be able to demonstrate best that you've achieved the outcomes of our particular courses? And I would really encourage you here then to try to be more creative about digital methods as well. Um, I'm showing you a poster on here, and that's because we have a postgraduate diploma for school nurses, health visitors, and district nurses. And some of the skills they uh, learn on this particular program would be around using some of the Adobe uh, packages, and also even when it comes to their assessments, rather than writing uh, um, assignments, some of them are now producing posters for conferences, or learning how to stand up and present at conferences or do e-conferences. So it's giving people the technological skills as well as the academic learning as, as well. Um, and on this one, I'm trying to pick out here some of the additional issues that may be problematic for you. So sexual and reproductive health could, uh, uh, um, uh, health education could be hit and miss across particular parts of the country and within practice areas. So that's... Uh, uh, really important to consider. Also, for those practitioners who have been around for a long time, um, are they still accessing update days? Are they using technology in the way that younger generations are using them to make sure that we're all singing from the same song sheet here? Also, there are difficulties where within a practice area, maybe one or two people are those who are specialists in reproductive health, and therefore everybody else refers the individuals onto them. But what happens if they're away? And we've seen that particularly now in this COVID era. What happens if they are away, uh, going to be away? So it's really important. I've mentioned the, the funding, especially on training and education, and that there's no protected time given for e-learning. So, so many of our students tell us that when they're required to do e-learning courses, they all have to do that within their own time. And for some of them who have got family commitments as well, they might actually say, well, I can't even get to the computer until my children have gone to bed at night. So there is an impact across learning. And the one reason why I wanted to mention this um, safer sex for people who stammer image to you is because one of our students on a promoting sexual health course actually did this. He did an Adobe Express page and it was looking at promoting sexual health and well-being for people who stammer. Not only did he create that page for his, uh, uh, his particular audience, but he actually then went on and presented this at a conference and wrote an article about it as well. So it's looking at ways in which learning can be developed and shared for greater benefit um, as much as possible. OK, and the final area now, really important that you look after yourselves. You can tell I'm getting a bit croaky at the moment. OK, really important you look after yourselves. And I'd say there are some top tips here. First of all, by looking after yourselves, make sure you take time out. So time out to have fun, time out to exercise, time out to feel good about it because you've got really heavy clinical work to do. And on top of that, so many of you are volunteering to do this educational role as well. And um, uh, it's really important for you to look after yourselves then, but also for you to be able to top up. So if you are looking at uh, new techniques, new apps, new skills to learn, you need the time and the capacity to be able to do that as well. And also being able to catch up with others. So as I mentioned, the wonder site earlier, maybe that's going to be a way in which you can start contacting others and certainly catching up and sharing your new ideas and learning. I've already shared this quote with you, something I wrote about in a book that was published uh, um, earlier this year, that we now have this new opportunity to create something fantastic, create something new as you're moving forward. So looking at ways in which you can challenge yourselves and even challenge your own assumptions around styles of teaching, learning and assessment and how that all fits in best with your clinical practice. And certainly it's ways 
of boosting the academic citizenship of your individual learners. And finally, then, some of the uh, challenges for you to consider. How are you going to address the assessments that have to be done in clinical practice compared to those that don't have to be done? That's going to be a real big challenge there to think about that. It may be a case of sharing new video opportunities for clients. So say, for example, if somebody is doing um, um, a sexual health assessment of an individual, if they would role play that in the, in your conference settings, then can they now video that? Can they share those videos with others? So looking at ways in which they can have fun with learning and fun, especially around um, digital learning, so that they can become far more creative in what they're doing. So it's going to be important to look at how to assess the outcomes of your learning. Look at how to design your curricula and the learning experiences, which are compassionate and best fit the need that you have for today and maximize creative digital teaching, learning and assessing, especially for your clinical practice and embedded within your qualifications. Okay, so I think I've kept the time on that one and I hope this session has been okay for you. I look forward to meeting you in the question and answer sessions. Thanks so much for listening.